From the versatile EQB to the sublime EQS sedan, Mercedes-Benz makes electric extraordinary. The vehicle's all electric, the feeling all Mercedes, the choice is all yours. Learn more at mbusa.com slash EQ. We'll settle on a poll question. Still looking for any team in college basketball history who would have a chance against the worst team in the NBA. And the reason why I brought this up is after hearing Mike Greenberg on ESPN say that the Connecticut team, the UConn men's team, could make the playoffs in the NBA. And I went, oh, that's not good. That's not going to age well. I reached out to DraftKings and I said, all right, what would the betting line be? Connecticut's men's team against the worst NBA team. And uh, they came back and said the Pistons would be favored by 45 over the uh, UConn team. Yes, Paul? I got three or four emails. This is, again, uh, before my time, but you would know this team. And Coach Izzo would. The 74 UCLA team that you mentioned, Bill Walton, Keith Wilkes, Marcus Johnson, Dave Myers, Richard Washington. I think they were all first-round draft picks, and Greg Lee was a good guard on them. They did not, in 74, win the title. In 74, they lost to NC State in the semifinal. Talent-wise, what do you think of that team? 75 had Richard Washington and Marcus Johnson. Bill Walton wasn't on that team. But that's a lot of talent. A lot of talent there. Did you have another one? That's it. Okay. Let's bring in Tom Izzo, Hall of Famer, 29 years at Michigan State. He's seen it all. All right, Coach, give me a team in basketball history that you think would be talented enough to compete with the worst team in the NBA. Well, I'm listening to you, uh, Dan, and I uh, I thought that Walton team, but you were right. In 74, they didn't. Uh, I was just uh, – in uh, high school then, so I'm, you know, not like you. I, I didn't remember those things as well, but I don't know. You know, we played a North Carolina team in uh, 05 that was, or yeah, our 09 that was really good. They had all those guys that came back. I thought that they ran through the league, but uh, NBA teams are still better, I think. I don't think any college team could beat an NBA team. Well, go back to when Michael Jordan was there with Worthy and Perkins. That's those are all good players. And Michael Jordan was a great player. Worthy and Perkins were great, but um, they were still young. then. you know, I, I, although the NBA was older back then, now the NBA is young too. So you bring up a good point. And uh, some of these teams you're talking about, I I've heard some teams in college basketball now, especially with this, this COVID transfer portal, you know, where guys are 24 or five years old, they're older than some NBA teams. The NBA is playing 82 games a year. They, um, I, I just don't think there's any that I know of that could beat an NBA team. Help me understand the transfer portal and why was it active during the tournament? Yeah, that, uh, you know, like I'm on a lot of committees and, um, I, you know, I hate to say this, but I will since I'm controversial like you. I, I think that was one of the craziest moves you know, we don't get that many days in the sun anymore, you know, with college football now coming into the middle of January, pro football going into February. Uh, the NCAA tournament is college basketball's day in the sun, and we pollute it with the transfer portal. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people make decisions without really talking to the people that are in the basement. And I think that's what's happened in a lot of things with the NCAA. Okay, but honest. who can fix this, Coach? Well, it sure as hell ain't the coaches. Uh, we don't have a lot of say. Um, maybe the players. They seem to be the only ones with power anymore, so maybe <laughs> the players can fix it. Yeah, but I'm trying to understand this. Now, maybe you're going to pull back the curtain for the audience here, but during the tournament, are you thinking about or hearing from other players who might want to transfer to Michigan State, or are you concerned that some of your own players might be thinking about being in the transfer portal? Well, I think that's a very good question. And I think that goes on from about January on. I think there's a lot of places where assistant coaches are recruiting kids off of people's campuses. I think, you know, I talked to Nick Saban, talked to Dabble Sweet. There's, there's coaches in football. I think, um, I think that's one of the problems right now because of these rules, everybody's half in, half out. And uh, it is a problem. The one thing I had heard some people talking about was playing in, deep into the NCAA tournament and still being in the transfer portal yeah. uh, staff meetings, I'd be a cold day in hell before that had happened here. You know, I think you got to take care of the players you got. 
And uh, yeah, I know you got to recruit, recruit, recruit. It's a 24 seven job now, but if I'm playing it, we get to a sweet 16, elite eight, final four. I'm not worried about the transfer portal. Okay. Back to Connecticut. If you were going to attack them, give, give me what would be your philosophy strategy to try to beat this Connecticut team? Well, after watching our own big 10 team, Illinois go at the big fella and I recruited him a little bit out of high school. Um, I wouldn't attack him. <laughs> you know, I try to drive and kick out and, and get some shots. You got to make shots against them because uh, he has become so much better this year than he was last year. It's uh, it's amazing. I think he's become better within the year and uh, he's just more aggressive. Uh, he's got size. He's got those long arms. And uh, I don't think, you know, I think you got to hope to turn him over some. Not easy. I think you got to hope to make shots. And it'll be interesting since Purdue is in it and they have a big guy of their own, if that ends up the finals, which I'm not saying this year it will because so many strange things have happened. But if it's Connecticut, Purdue in the finals, it could be a, a real interesting game with those two bigs. Okay, but you don't attack the big men and try to get them in foul trouble? You better have a hell of a center to do that. Uh, you know, you better have a guy that's not only big enough, strong enough, good enough, can score it well enough. Well, Otherwise, Edie can do it. that. Edie can do Again, that. Edie. Edie? Yeah. He can. Uh, what what he doesn't do uh, sometimes is, you know, not as mobile as some, although he's more mobile than you think. So, you know, if you just play big, now he still might score his points. And uh, that's what happened to us against him. He scored his points. So you got to maybe contain those other guys. You pick and choose your poison. Is it tough to watch the final four? Really tough. Um, that's why I'm here talking to you instead <laughs> of doing it. But, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I've had the privilege of going eight times. And, and let me tell you, that is a privilege. And I, I just talked to Gene Cady yesterday. I called him to congratulate him on Matt Painter and, you know, the Cady Heathcote. Painter Izzo thing is, you know, it's all been part of the tree. And uh, and Gene was so excited. And I always say, boy, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I think he was one of the great coaches in America, never even touched the Final Four. I think he went to one Elite Eight, and he's one of the best. So um, it's hard to watch, but I'm privileged that I got to play in it. We're talking to Tom Izzo, the head coach at Michigan State. How hard is it to continue to do this when you look at all these coaches that decide, I don't want to put up with Transfer Portal and NIL. I mean, Saban, you know, uh, Jay Wright. I mean, go down the list, Bayheim. They're like, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. It is hard. And, you know, Nick Saban and I are good friends. Nick started here as an assistant. So did I. Started here at head coach, same time. I talked to Nick, Jay Wright, good friend. Roy Williams, you know, Jim Beheim. I mean, sometimes age gets you, but sometimes it's the situation. And uh, anybody that tells you that this has not been maybe the most taxing, incredible, confusing state of college sports, they're lying to you. It is. But uh, I'm not sure I want to give in to that either. So uh, right now I'm, I'm keep on trucking. But uh, it has, Dan. It's been... Uh, it's been different, you know, uh, the Dayton grad you are. I know that uh, Dayton had a good run this year. Who knows who's going to be coming back, who's leaving. I don't think any coach knows that about any player, and that's kind of sad. How – let's say you're recruiting me. How long into well, the conversation? I'm not going that low, Dan. Okay, I'm, you're right. You're right. It, but uh, okay. let's, let's say it just for keepsake, okay? Okay. Let's say you're recruiting, a you know, a, a McDonald's All-American kid. How – deep into the conversation before how much money can I make coach? Does it happen? What we found out is, you know, even from last year to the this year, it's tripled. But if you're talking in the transfer portal, I mean, some of those coaches you mentioned, that was some of the things that happened. The minute they said, hello, I'm Tom Izzo. It's what's my package. You know, I think that is a... So more is, more in the transfer portal than with kids coming out of high school. It seems that way because I think what happens in the transfer portal is um, kids know that a coach wants you maybe because he's trying to save his job and maybe the money will go up and all that kind of stuff. Whereas freshmen, although we argued on our board that it's going to hurt freshmen, you know, there's not as many freshmen being recruited as not many freshmen playing. 
And uh, I think that's one of the unintended consequences to this. What do you think about expanding the tournament? I have mixed feelings on it. Um, I can't say I'm crazy about it. Uh, and in one part, because it's so exciting the way it is. And I can't say that there aren't some teams, you know, we played Indiana state this year and they're really good. And they almost beat Seton hall last night. And that NIT, I, I think, uh, Here's North Carolina State. If the most unbelievable set of events don't happen at the end of the Virginia game, they're sitting home and you're talking to, to Keats instead of me. So um, there are teams that deserve to get in. And uh, I got enough problems dealing with the transfer portal, the NLI, and my own players. I'll leave that up to the committees because coaches don't have a lot of say in any of these things. What do you make of the growth of the women's game? I think it's impressive. Uh, you know, I mean uh, – I watched the other night, um, you know, not just because she's an Iowa Big Ten girl, but I, I've watched uh, the women's basketball. I, I'm a big Gino Ariema fan. I, I've watched him for years. But the explosion of it has been incredible and deserving. And and it is exciting. Now, I, I get a little confused when they bring up ticket prices for the women's games. I mean, they're played in an arena of seven, eight, or 17,000 where ours are 60, 70,000. But I do think uh, I'm a big fan of women's basketball. I've uh, been a fan of the women coaches here. But this has been an exciting few years, and a lot of it because of Caitlin, but a lot of it because what South Carolina has done, what Gino's done, he gets taken for granted. He might be one of the best all-time coaches in any sport, and including this year, Dan, when he had all those injuries yeah. and he stuck the Final Four. Yeah. You know, this is the best your voice has sounded, but you probably hate that your voice sounds this good because that means you're not coaching in the uh, tournament. You know, I, I, I say this a lot to you, but my, my voice is never bad because of the coaching. It's always bad because of the lack of sleep. And during the tournament, you don't get any sleep. And when you don't sleep, not that I sleep a lot now, but now I don't sleep because of all those other reasons <laughs> you just talked about before it was my team. But either way, uh, who the hell needs a voice? You know, you do. I, I do. Really I do. How do you think my voice would go over if I'm in the huddle and I don't have to yell? I just say, guys, this is what we're going to do. I know what grandma would say to you. He'd probably say something different to you, but you know what, man, you got a good voice, man. You got a good voice. And uh, I think it would transfer well over to the coaching profession. Yeah. My voice is sort of Steph Curry's jumper. <laughs> well, it's not that good, but it's, it's good. I like it. I've enjoyed you. Uh, enjoy the off season. If there is such a thing as the off season. Thank you, coach. Thanks, Dan. That's Tom Izzo, Hall of Famer. 29 years at Michigan State. Always good to talk to him.